I apologize for the slightly delayed start as we awaited our COVID restricted, limited audience to, to the venue. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker for this evening. Jason C. Slot is an associate professor of mycology and evolutionary genomics at the Ohio State University. Dr. Slot received a BA in molecular biology and biochemistry in 1996, and an MA in science education from Boston University in 2000. Dr. Slot is an author of over 60 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. His doctoral dissertation at Clark University and his postdoctoral work at the Vanderbilt University focused on the molecular evolution of ecologically relevant genes in fungi. As faculty of plant pathology at the Ohio State University, Columbus, in Ohio, in the United States, he uses comparative and functional genomics along with metabolomics to investigate the evolution and ecology of fungi, special biochemistry in various fungal niches, including plant pathogens and symbionts and insect pathogens. Pioneering sequencing of psilocybin mushroom genomes in his lab recently led to the identification and evolutionary analysis of psilocybin gene clusters. It's really a great pleasure and honor to invite Jason Slot to address us this afternoon. It is his first time here in Jamaica, and we give you a warm Jamaican welcome to both the Faculty of Science and Technology here at the University of the West Indies and also to the field of the laboratory here on campus. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much, Rupika. And thank you all for attending and having me here at your university. I am really glad to be here. It's been a wonderful stay so far. And Today I, today, I hope to uh, talk to you about my research in fungi and fungal genomics. And I hope to convince you that the biochemical diversity that uh, fungi have is shaped both by their ecological pressures and genomic architecture that's influenced by uh, their ecology. So I'm going to deliver a talk to you today in three parts. In the first part, I'll be talking to you about fungal metabolite gene cluster evolution. And uh, a lot of my work has to do with evolutionary biology and this concept of gene clusters, which I'll, I'll detail in a moment. The second part of my talk is uh, an explanation how I'll be using an evolutionary approach to the discovery of the psilocybin biosynthetic pathway and then finally, I'm going to tie this all together to describe some genomic trends in mushrooms and mold fungi. So here's some photographs of fungi uh, that you may be familiar with in the environment. In the, can you see my pointer? You can't. In the upper left, we have uh, plant pathogens. It's cochleobolus, uh, carbonarum. It infects corn leaves causes yield loss in, in the corn. We have in the middle and the top uh, Aspergillus flavus, which is a mold that infects post-harvest uh, grains and nuts, which leaves behind. Well, I'll talk about that in a moment. In the upper right, we have a lichen, which is also a fungus, but it's in symbiosis with an algae or a cyanobacteria, uh, becoming a primary producer on its own. In the lower right, we have a wood decaying uh, basidiomycete. We think of it as a mushroom, and this is actually a poisonous mushroom. And then in the lower left, we have human uh, idols to the psilocybe mushrooms in Central America, which have had important impacts on human culture for thousands of years. And when I look at this picture here, I have a different vision. I see the chemicals that are uh, allowing these organisms to have their ecological effects. In the upper left, the cochleobolus pathogen is using 
the HC toxin that it produces in order to kill the fungal tissue and cause disease. It feeds on it as a necrotrope. In the middle, we have the most potent carcinogen of natural occurrence, which is aflatoxin, produced by the Aspergillus flavus. Uh, and it's produced by that fungus. Uh, it ends up causing massive yield losses to corns and nuts. And we don't know what the ecological role of that is. In the upper right, we have the lichen produces something called usnic acid, which is a bitter yellow-ish uh, compound. It may deter herbivores from eating the lichens, but it also seems to have a sunscreening effect on the lichen. In the lower right, we have uh, the alpha amatoxin, which is a highly deadly compound which you may hopefully never encounter in eating a toxic mushroom. And in the lower left, we have psilocybin, which is a hallucinogenic compound which has caused uh, religious experiences throughout time. Now, all of these compounds are produced by these organisms, but we don't necessarily know why they, uh, what the value of them is to the fungus itself. Uh, in some cases, however, we do. One unique phenomenon, or interesting phenomenon, it's not entirely unique, uh, in the production of these compounds by fungi is that the genes to produce them are encoded in what we call metabolic gene clusters, or sometimes we say biosynthetic gene clusters. I'll use both of those terms today. Uh, and, and these are uh, loci, positions in the genome that have all the genes necessary to produce that particular substance or perform that particular metabolic uh, pathway. And that includes genes for the enzymes that transform biological molecules, genes for regulation of the entire pathway, and also genes for transporting metabolites in and out of the, the cell and the pathway. And metabolic gene clusters are very widespread in bacteria, and they're somewhat widespread in fungi, and we don't really see them in plants and animals to a large extent. So this is really things that are, this is a phenomenon that's somewhat unique to microorganisms, and among eukaryotic life, uh, pretty much restricted to the fungi. Some of the functions that are encoded in metabolic gene clusters are shown here, and this is, uh, this is a Wordle diagram that indicates the relative proportion of gene clusters and their functions. So you, we can see things like vitamin biosynthesis, certain uh, nutrient utilization and special uh, food source assimilation. Uh, we have um, antibiotic production and other secondary metabolism, largely we do not know the function of that secondary metabolism. So these gene clusters are really involved in a lot of the ecologically significant functions, but not necessarily the main functions inside of the cell of the fungus. So I told you that secondary metabolism clusters uh, occur in fungi, and to a small extent, we find them in plants. And here are some examples which you probably can easily read, but what I'm really showing you here is I'm breaking up this list of uh, gene clusters by the types of organisms that they're found in. So up at the top, we have a term that I'm going to, this is a subphylum of fungi I'm going to be referring through throughout the lecture called Pizizomycotina. And these are the molds and uh, small filamentous fungi that are sometimes plant pathogens, the lichens I showed you. Uh, so the more simple fungi, and there are a lot of gene clusters that have been identified in these fungi. But mushrooms are also important fungi, and they have, we've identified comparatively fewer secondary metabolism clusters and gene clusters in general in these fungi. And then in plants, there is only a very small handful of gene clusters. And in, in some cases, it's, it's arguable whether or not those are actually real gene clusters as we think of them. So I'm going to repeatedly come back to this idea of 
differences amongst the mold forming fungi, the mushroom forming fungi in plants in terms of their clustering of the genes and the secondary metabolism, the natural products that they produce. So one phenomenon that's associated with these secondary metabolism gene clusters is that they have been found to be horizontally transferred between fungi. Uh, horizontal gene transfer, if you're not familiar with it, is the uh, movement or the acquisition of DNA from one species by another species. And we're most often familiar with this in the hospital setting where uh, antibiotic resistance gene clusters or antibiotic resistance genes are acquired by bacteria to become uh, antibiotic resistant uh, by exposure to other bacteria. Well, this also happens in fungi, and it's very common in metabolic gene clusters. We found examples of nitrate assimilation clusters, nutritional galactose utilization clusters, very large metabolic gene clusters associated with a type of aflatoxin called stereogmatocystin, uh, other secondary metabolite clusters, uh, degradation clusters, clusters that are involved in breaking down plant secondary metabolites, plant ecological defenses. Um, and so horizontal gene transfer is when a, a gene from one organism has been acquired by another one. And if we were to, we identify it usually in the evolutionary trees of the genes in the genomes. So for instance, what you're looking at here is a species tree, a species phylogeny, and species A and B on the top here, species A and B have the gene, gene number one, and then its closest relatives, C, D, and E, do not have that gene. Um, and then more distant relatives, G, H, and I, have the gene. So in the species tree, we'd see that the presence of this particular gene one is scattered across uh, the tree of life. But if we were to look at the phylogeny of the gene itself, we would see that uh, the A and B gene is very closely related to the G gene, indicating that it has been horizontally transferred from an ancestor of the G species to the A species. So this is just generally how we see horizontal gene transfer in our evolutionary analysis. I won't show you a lot of this. I just wanted to make it known how we're inferring these results. And here's an example here. And what I'm going to show you here is how when we find horizontal transfer of gene clusters, it can often indicate the ecological role that these gene clusters have. So for instance, what we have here is uh, two plant pathogens. Pathog um, they're pathogens of, in this case, rice. Magnaportha rhizae is a rice pathogen. And over here is Cochleobulus myobianus, which is a corn leaf pathogen. And they have very similar ecologies, and they're exposed to uh, similar plant defensive metabolites. In this case, the still bean molecules. And this gene cluster here up at the top is, uh, has all the signs of being involved in breaking down that still bean molecule into smaller phenolic molecules and then finally metabolizing those small phenolic molecules for a carbon source. And what I'm showing you on the trees on the side is the, the evolutionary positioning of each of these species and how that gene cluster has been acquired from one part of the tree in Magnaportha to another part of the tree in Cochleobulus. So that, that they both have the same ecological role and that they ha there has been this horizontal transfer of this pathway suggests that uh, the ability to break down still beans is important to grass pathogens. And the connection between horizontal transfer and gene clusters is not necessarily an accident. There is a theory called the selfish cluster hypothesis that suggests that uh, clustering may be, in some ways, the result of horizontal gene transfer. And the idea is this, that if a metabolic pathway to produce a compound, for instance, 
is unclustered, three genes are scattered across the genome, the chances of uh, more than one gene being acquired by horizontal transfer at a time are very small uh, because those genes won't be on the same chunk of DNA that could be slurped up from the environment by a bacteria or a fungus. And in that case, if there's only one of the genes of the pathway, what use is this pathway? What use is this particular gene? It's lost by genetic drift. However, if the genes are located in close proximity to each other and they contribute to a common metabolic function or a common pathway, they can easily all be acquired simultaneously and therefore confer the complete function to the recipient genome. So it's been proposed that this can sequentially generate gene clusters, grow gene clusters by repeated uh, iterations of this process. So the idea is that if there are genes that are weakly selected on their own, they may survive more if they participate in clusters that can survive horizontal gene transfer. That's the essence of the selfish cluster hypothesis. And what's interesting is that we can use this occurrence of horizontal transfer of gene clusters to actually detect new gene clusters. So what I'm showing you here is a proof of concept that if you scan across the gene or scan across a chromosome of a particular fungus and you, you look at the ancestry of each of the genes along the way, you can identify those that have been horizontally transferred from other fungi. And if you uh, find regions where they have a, a common donor, then you can identify uh, a gene cluster that has been simultaneously horizontally transferred, all of those genes. In this case, this is a reproduction of a 25 gene cluster that was transferred from uh, Aspergillus nigilans, a mold in the soil, and Podospora anserina, which has a healthy appetite for the resting structures of that mold in the soil. So we think that this particular fungus, Podospora, uh, parasitized the other fungus and acquired its DNA to get this gene cluster. And it turns out that this gene cluster, or the sterigmatocystin toxin, is actually a very potent larvicide, which appears to benefit the Podospora in its lifestyle. So this leads to the concept of that we can use evolutionary genomics, we can use the signature of evolution to discovering novel biosynthetic pathways in genomes. It's, it's actually computationally not tractable to search through the entire genome compute gene phylogenies for every single one and identify gene clusters in the way that I showed you in the last slide. But we can apply algorithms that are more heuristic to uh, use this trend to identify novel clusters. Uh, and this is one of those trends that my student developed uh, a few years back. And the idea was that you could uh, look for a signature of unexpected gene order across uh, comparative genomes. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if two species are very unrelated, but the order of the genes in their genome, and in particular loci, is more similar than you would expect by chance, that's a sign that either it was horizontally transferred, as I showed you before, or them being co-inherited uh, is a sign that they share a function that can't be, uh, the constituent genes can't really be broken apart. So this method searches for uh, a particular gene of interest, and in, which we call an anchor gene, and then it looks across uh, a database of fungal genomes for shared syntony or shared gene order across the genomes. And what are some of the things that we discovered using this method when we applied it? Well, we identified in a database of a little over 500 fungal genomes, 
we identified an entire new class of gene clusters that were involved in the breakdown of plant secondary metabolites. Uh, we searched uh, with 13 anchor genes that are involved in phenolic compound breakdown, and then we were able to identify a large number of gene clusters, predominantly in this lineage, the Pizizomycotina, uh, that had particular associations with ecological roles of the fungi from saprotrophism to endophytism, uh, symbiotrophism. And so th this is, you know, these are hundreds or thousands of clusters that probably have a role in diseases evolving, resistances to uh, plant defenses against pathogens, and all of these things. And we found them predominantly in the molds in the Pizizomycotina here. But if you look comparatively in the yeasts, the Saccharomycotina, we don't really find them, and then in uh, the mushrooms, which are more morphologically complex and have a more long-lived lifestyle than the molds, they also really didn't have any significant amount of gene clustering. So this seems to be a phenomenon that's largely restricted to, granted, the most diverse group of fungi, but uh, a particular group of fungi, the filamentous ascomycetes, or pizizomycotina. We took a, a similar approach where we detected clusters of, for biosynthetic genes to make secondary metabolites, natural product discovery, uh, by looking for pairs of genes that were unexpectedly next to each other in the genome across the largest class of fungi, the dithidiomycetes. And we used those unexpected pairs of genomes to look of genes to identify loci that had a lot of those unexpected pairs. And what we were able to do was what we were able to do is identify basically the entire secondary metabolome, uh, and I'll, I'll put caveats on that in the next slide, the entire secondary metabolome, all the genes, all the gene clusters for secondary metabolites across this entire class of 101 dithidiomycete genomes. And you can see the, the little dots are how the uh, individual clusters are dispersed. They're very patchy. Uh, this is a sign that we're detecting them through uh, their, their history of horizontal gene transfer or uh, differential loss across the tree. Some of the things that we found were that uh, we were able to increase the, the known size of these gene clusters. We found additional genes that hadn't been identified before with other types of methods, and we detected a lot of novel gene clusters as well. Now, if you're familiar with this natural product search through uh, genomes, through comparative genomics, uh, you'll know the program anti-SMASH. This is the gold standard for detecting metabolic gene clusters or secondary meta metabolite gene clusters in genomes, mostly for bacteria, but also for fungi. And uh, there's a plant eye smash to search for them in plants as well. So this is in the, uh, in the the dark gray at the top, anti-SMASH is the gold standard. And you can see that there's overlap with our co-occurring gene method down in the lower right, but uh, there, there's not complete overlap. These are very complementary methods. We identified thousands of genes that anti-SMASH didn't, and anti-SMASH identified thousands of genes that our method did not. And the same thing with individual loci. There were thousands of uh, differently identified gene clusters, and a much smaller number were identified by both methods. So this just goes to show that using evolution as a signature can acquire new information that we weren't getting before. Incidentally, the anti-SMASH algorithm works in a way that it is based on our knowledge of pre-existing, predefined gene clusters. So it's looking for certain loci that have an expected gene composition. And our methods don't do that. Our methods are looking for just a coordinated evolution signature. So we find very different things. So when we uh, try to think 
how this can inform us about the ability to identify novel secondary metabolites, we can compare uh, the size of the genome to the, the size of the uh, cluster profiles of these organisms and the diversity of those organ, uh, gene clusters in that organism. So this graph here is showing you that as the, the number of clusters in an individual fungus grows, the absolute diversity of those clusters is growing proportionally. So they're not generating new secondary metabolites just by copying the ones that they already have. Every new secondary metabolism cluster they get is very different from the ones that they already have. That's what this graph is showing you here, adding unique types of metabolism. And then if we uh, do a rarefaction analysis, we can predict how much of a payoff there will be for every new species that we sequence their genome to how many new metabolic gene clusters we'll find. And you can see in this rarefaction analysis of 49 genomes in the Pleus borreliis, we're, we're far from identifying all the gene clusters we could in this one particular order of filamentous fungi. So there's lots of room for sequencing more genomes and identifying more potential metabolic diversity. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and show you how these concepts of gene cluster horizontal transfer was really the basis of our approach to identifying the psilocybin biosynthetic pathway in magic mushrooms. So if you're not familiar with psilocybin, Psilocybin is a tryptamine metabolite produced by uh, a number of very divergent mushroom-forming fungi and some insect pathogens, strangely. Uh, and the psilocybin is actually a prodrug. It's converted by the removal of a phosphate group to psilocin, which is a mimic for serotonin. It interacts with serotonin receptors, particularly the 5-HT2A receptor, in the brain and it changes uh, blood flow and, and blood oxygen volume leading to a psychedelic or hallucinogenic experience in the human mind. And we don't know what that particular compound is for ecologically, but we know that it's a potential uh, pharmaceutical for a lot of uh, mental conditions that it's being investigated for. Uh, psilocin, psilocybin, um, is also very similar to a compound bufotenin. Uh, it differs from psilocin. Bufotenin differs from psilocin only in the positioning of this hydroxyl group here. And that's produced by toads. And it's also produced by toad stools. And you find both of those things in uh, fairy tale uh, pictures, toads and toad stools. And you wonder if maybe some of these compounds are the reason for that historical association. So our question when we started, because this most basic uh, biology, most basic uh, genetics of psilocybin was not known when we embarked on this research 10 years ago, uh, because it had been a Schedule I substance for 40 years, and that really suppressed all research into just basic, uh, basic science about magic mushrooms. But we wanted to know exactly how mushrooms became magic. What we did know is that they're across the uh, phylogenetic tree here of mushroom forming fungi, that there were a few groups with a, a few or many of the members of that group that produced psilocybin, but those groups were really scattered across the tree, a bunch of unrelated mushrooms making the same compound. And a lot of them may have seemed to have a similar ecological role. We have a lot of them that are involved in decaying really old wood, rotten wood, sometimes in the soil, uh, wood chips. And a number of them seem to be associated with herbivore dung, uh, cow dung for Psilocybe cubensis, and hippopotamus dung for this Penelus africanus. Um, there's other wood decay fungi that are far scattered. They're so unrelated that they're not even on this phylogenetic tree. 
So how is it that we have all these unrelated fungi with somewhat similar ecologies ending up with the same pathway? Well, this rings a bell in you know, our mind. Maybe it was horizontally transferred. Maybe it was a gene cluster. How can we test for that? So there's two competing hypotheses that an evolutionary genomicist would come to when they see a data set like this. They would think, hmm, well, either the ancestor, the common ancestor of all of these mushrooms had the ability to make psilocybin, and then it was lost many times throughout the tree and only a few retained it. This is our first hypothesis. And the second hypothesis is that there were multiple origins of the ability to make psilocybin across the tree. And this could be because of convergent evolution. Uh, different enzymes came together to form this pathway in different parts of the tree, or the dispersal by horizontal gene transfer, which is one of the main themes for today. Well, at this time, there were no genomes. We didn't know any of the genes that were involved, so we decided to take a comparative approach to identifying the genes that were involved. We sequenced three uh, very different mushroom species. We sequenced Paniolus cyanescens, Psilocybe cyanescens, and Gymnopolis. Uh, this is uh, actually, the name has changed a few times. I believe it's Luteus now. And you can see where they are located on the tree. We also sequenced an Inocibe, but that, um, that genome had some problems, so it didn't make it into our final story. And then we selected the, closely, the most closely related genomes of fungi that do not make psilocybin, so that we could do a comparative analysis. So three psilocybin-producing mushrooms, three relatives that do not produce, and then we identified all the genes that were shared across the species. And we were able to find 16,000 genes total in the data set. And then there were only 32 of those genes that distinguished the psilocybin positive fungi from the psilocybin negative fungi. Unfortunately, most of those functions were kind of you know, inscrutable. They, they were somewhat general functions, and the function alone was not sufficient, but when we ran those genes through an analysis for clustering, it turned out that these, they converged on a single gene cluster. And when we look back on the functions in those clusters, it started to make sense. And what we ended up with was the uh, psilocybin mushrooms were distinguished from the most close relatives by the insertion of this five-ish gene cluster here. It included a uh, tryptophan decarboxylase, a cytochrome P450 monooxygenase or hydroxylase, a kinase, and a methyltransferase, and also a transporter of unknown function. And this, was con this uh, arrangement of genes was similar in all the different lineages. And then we wanted to ask, OK, well, why do all these different mushrooms end up with these genes? Uh, so we ran a gene phylogeny, and it turned out that we think the origin of the gene cluster was around here in the phylogeny of this gene. And we can trace it down to a molecular clock down at the bottom here. And you can see we estimate that the gene cluster probably originated right around the KT extinction event about 65 million years ago. And then uh, at some point in the diversification of the psilocybe lineage, there was a horizontal gene transfer from psilocybe cubensis lineage to the paniolus cyanescens lineage. The interesting part of that discovery was that both of those fungi involved in the horizontal gene transfer were dung fungi. And we subsequently identified uh, another horizontal transfer that was in, in two late wood decay fungi. So multiple horizontal gene transfer events that were associated with the same ecological niche. And we can sort of piece this together and the, in the, uh, the big picture of 
Earth history, we can think of wood having arisen as a substrate for fungi a few hundred million years ago. And wood had a, had a great run, a couple hundred million years run, until wood decay fungi came along. And this wood decay fungi in this particular lineage of organisms, the only organisms that can break down a, per, a significant portion of the Earth's wood. So they come around, these different fungi, and somewhere in, in the diversification of all these wood decay fungi, psilocybin evolves. Maybe right around the time that termites evolve and start competing with fungi to break down that wood. And then there's an extinction event, transforms that uh, forested earth over five or 10 million years, transforms it into grasslands that then take over a large portion of the earth, and followed by the expansions of the grasslands, we get these little tiny warm-blooded organisms called mammals go from like very tiny size to giant uh, mega herbivores, multi-ton herbivores, eating all that grass and leaving large amounts of herbivore dung on the, on the grasslands. And that's right around the time that we see the emergence of a number of mushrooms that decay herbivore dung. And so in that herbivore dung lineage, we, in that herbivore dung uh, ecology, we think that somehow psilocybin was important enough to be exchanged by horizontal transfer amongst those mushrooms. So why dung? What's the selective advantage of having psilocybin in dung? Well, we speculated that it had something to do with the number of insect competitors or mycophagous insects that also live in the dung, and maybe it was somehow preventing the fungi from being consumed too much, reducing their fitness when they were trying to make mushrooms in that dung. So another question that emerged is, the, our initial look, it looked like this cluster just appeared out of nowhere and all of a sudden was being horizontally transferred. So we really wanted to track down where it came from. What was the origin of the gene cluster? And there were no intermediate states. You think you might find a cluster of two genes and then some other scattered genes in a genome. But all we found is outside of the core agaric Haley's lineage here, where the, the uh, psilocybin mushrooms are, the only other fungus that had these genes, all of these genes, was a crust-forming fungus called, a thiali, uh, called a fibula rhizoctonia in the thiliales. And this one was really interesting because it had 54 copies of the cytochrome P450 and two copies of the uh, tryptophan decarboxylase, 18 copies of the transporter, and there was no cluster. And we were really excited about this because we thought maybe with all these potential genes in here, maybe psilocybin originated in this particular fungus. And uh, the interesting thing about this fungus is we thought that this genome was the cuckoo fungus. If you've not heard of the cuckoo fungus, this is a fungus that makes these tiny little sclerotia the same size and shape of termite eggs. And it actually convinces termites to take care of its sclerotia exactly as they're their own eggs. They care for them, they clean them off, and they pile them in, in piles of their own eggs. And we thought maybe psilocybin was involved somehow in manipulating the behavior of those termites. But unfortunately, the genome that was reported to be the termite symbiont, we, we searched for psilocybin production and we could not find it. And that was because it was mislabeled. The, the actual fungus was uh, that the genome had been reported that we'd found all those genes in was actually a carrot pathogen and not related to termite uh, symbiosis or termite uh, uh, mimicry. And so when we sequenced the actual cuckoo fungus, it was missing one of the key enzymes, the, the psilocybin synthase enzyme here. It didn't have it, so there's no chance that that could be involved in the termite symbiosis. But we're still searching. This is an ongoing 
uh, question in our lab. We're searching in, the, in that family, in that order of fungi, for intermediate steps. And maybe we can find the uh, center of diversity of the psilocybin cluster, the center of origin of the psilocybin cluster, to maybe find uh, novel metabolites that uh, are similar and having a similar effect the same way you might go to the center of origin of a, uh, a plant species to find defenses against its main predators. Now I'm, I'm going to wrap up the talk today talking about some of the patterns that we noticed in these genomes as we've uh, characterized the gene clusters and some of the differences that we've seen in the genetic architecture that seems to be relevant to how different fungi make secondary metabolites and or don't make secondary metabolites. And one of the things that we noticed is shown here on the left are the mold fungi. Uh, and this is one particular order in the Physizomycotina, the Eurotiales. This includes Aspergillus um, and other fungi, other mold-like fungi. And you can see that we identified a lot of different cluster families or gene clusters, and they're predominantly of a couple of different types, polyketides, polyketide synthase-based clusters, and non-ribosomal peptide synthase-based clusters. Uh, and these are, these are generally very large clusters, and they're very often found to be horizontally transferred amongst molds uh, in those types of fungi. But if we look in the agaricales, the mushroom-forming fungi, there's comparatively few. And, that, and the gene clusters in the agaricales are also very small. So what's going on here? Why do molds have lots of large clusters and mushrooms have few and very small clusters? There could, there could be various reasons for this. It could be that the anti-smash program that I was telling you about has been adapted to a very specific set of gene clusters that have been characterized. And that specific set is basically just a handful of mold species. Aspergillus, the Aspergillus genus itself makes up uh, over a third of the known clusters out there. And its closest relatives make up the better part of a half. And then the others, mostly all from molds. And you can see at agaricomycetes, which is those mushrooms there, we have four in the database. So the chances of building a proper model to detect the clusters that may or may not exist in mushrooms is actually pretty small. So is it our methods? Is that why we don't detect gene clusters? Or is there a different genomic biology? And I'm going to argue that it's probably both, but more the latter. They have different genome biology. Mushrooms are complex morphologically, and they have a long life cycle, and they have their nuclei isolated to separate cells, and not all cells get to become a mushroom and spread their DNA onto the next generation. Whereas molds uh, frequently exchange their DNA with other molds in the environment, and they reproduce very quickly, so they have a lot of selection pressure to acquire, to, to try out and utilize and acquire new metabolism from the environment. And so we call that up at the top here, you can see that we're showing you, they have a very open genome, like bacteria. Molds can acquire new DNA from related molds or from other organism in the, organisms in the environment, and they don't necessarily pass all their genes on to their offspring. Whereas on the right side, plants have a very closed genome. They don't really acquire a lot of new genes from the environment, um, and they pass most of their genes on to their offspring. So most of the genes are isolated to their species and their, their populations. But then mushrooms are in the middle. They have a mix. There is some horizontal transfer, but they're quite a bit more complex than bacteria and molds. So they're, they're somewhere in the middle. So we do see gene clusters, 
and we can describe this as different genome architecture. So here are the bacteria and the molds. They have complex gene clusters and very many of them that lead to very diverse secondary metabolism. And then in the middle, we have the mushrooms, which have a few somewhat compositionally diverse gene clusters, which lead to an intermediate diversity of secondary metabolites. And then plants have very few clusters that are not very diverse, and they really generate the diversity by copying already existing genes and branching off of uh, the pathways that they already have. And this can actually uh, lead to selection for what kinds of genes tend to be the most important for a particular lineage to generate diversity. For instance, plants have a lot of diversity of terpenoids. In terpenoids, it's very easy to generate a lot of metabolic diversity from very simple genetic changes to enzymes. Whereas bacteria and molds, they tend to have these uh, enzymes that function very well in large gene clusters like non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. So not only do they have very different genetic architecture, the kinds of metabolism that is favored in each of these individual lineages is downstream of their genetic architecture. But their genetic architecture is downstream of their life cycle. The, the reproductive rate of these fungi and other organisms. So I'll finish, and oh good, I have a few minutes left. Uh, the, uh, I'll finish with just illustrating a specific example of this phenomenon that, we, that I saw deriving from the psilocybin project, but not precisely about psilocybin. Uh, I'm going to show you about the origin of novel secondary metabolism genes in one group and the same genes in another group, uh, the molds versus the mushrooms. And this, this actually sprung out from a project in Dirk Hofmeister's lab. And Dirk Hofmeister was uh, approaching the discovery of the psilocybin cluster from a different angle, and he actually got there. Uh, he was the first to describe the enzymatic steps in the psilocybin pathway by doing a, a really chemistry-focused uh, methodology, where he was looking at specific enzymes in one species with very known, with very um, characteristic signatures of their functions, and then just uh, expressing them and trying to see what exactly they did. And the first uh, candidate that he had for the methyltransferase that makes psilocybin um, was this, uh, this gene here, which, uh, what are we going to call this? I forgot to put the name of the gene here. Uh, you'll see it on subsequent slides. TRIPM, sorry, it was TRIPM. And it turned out that instead of being the psilocybin synthase, which you see on the right, it was doing roughly the same function, N-methylating tryptophan, resulting in a molecule called hypophorin, which is important in, it appears to be important in mushroom-forming fungi that interact with plant roots symbiotically. But for him, it was a dead end, and he asked me if I would uh, do an evolutionary analysis on that and to see if there was anything interesting. Well, it turns out that it was very interesting. It was one of the most um, uh, eureka moments for me in molecular evolution. It turns out that this particular gene is what you see as this TRIPM EGDT gene here. It has uh, this methyltransferase function only, but it turns out that it was recently evolved by duplication of the uh, ergosterol synthetase gene, synthase gene here, EGTDB. It was just, it copied the first domain, but not the second domain, and then it, the very quickly after that, it seems that the function shifted from turning uh, histidine into, sorry, not ergosterol, ergothionine. Um, instead of performing that function, it very quickly became adapted to tryptophan to make hypophorin. So this happened 
once anciently, you can see here in the bottom of the tree, there was this ancient duplication, but very few of the species that were descended from that duplication event retained it. The gene was duplicated, changed its function, and was just rapidly lost. But it was retained in a few species, in that one psilocybe species that the Hofmeister lab was working on, and a couple, a few related species. But it's even still, in closely related species, continuing to be lost. It's not stable in the genome. And then when we looked across the rest of the tree, this has happened many times. But every time that that partial duplication arises, it seems to be lost. Uh, it's a very, very rare event, and it seems to happen repeatedly. So it appears that the ability to make probably secondary metabolites in this method arises a lot. It arises very often, but because it's unstable, it has to happen repeatedly through evolution. Well, this same gene, OK, I'll, I'll have to show this here. This is just a, uh, this is a bioinformatic way of uh, showing how the duplicate copy, the partial duplication of the ergothionine synthase gene leads to a loss of specificity for the original substrate, histidine, and opens it up to being uh, involved in secondary metabolism instead. So this same gene, the same thing has happened in the molds, but had a very different evolutionary history afterwards. So there was an ancient duplication of just the EGTD EGT domain, but it wasn't rapidly lost. It was actually incorporated into secondary metabolism gene clusters. It happened only once anciently. And then it was rapidly incorporated into secondary metabolism gene clusters. And what do those secondary metabolism gene clusters do? They started spreading by horizontal gene transfer. And one of those is the ergotamine gene cluster. This is what eventually led to lysergic acid, diethylamide, LSD, another psychoactive compound. Uh, and these clusters, it turns out, have uh, ecological roles preventing nematode herbivory that seems to benefit fungi that acquire them by horizontal gene transfer. So we can see that the evolutionary trends are very different in these two groups, and it leads to very different types of metabolism. The ergotamine clusters are much more complex uh, than the psilocybin, uh, much more complex than the hypophorin molecule. Uh, so all these things come together to show that they're very different evolution, very different genome structure, and very different chemical diversity resulting in the mushrooms in the mold. So genome structure is an important factor in chemical diversity. Gene clustering is determined by the life history strategies of the fungi and their ability to undergo evolutionary events like horizontal gene transfer, which can indicate what the ecological roles of the fungi, of the metabolites might be. Uh, and you can think of it as, well, if we know that these metabolites are important in this ecological role, then maybe we can search fungi with that ecological role to identify similar functions. If we're looking for neuroactive metabolites, maybe we'll continue to look in dung fungi. Genome evolution mode impacts the type of chemical diversity. Mushrooms make simple amino acid metabolites more often, and uh, molds make non-ribosomal peptides more often. Uh, and I just finish with the idea that we can use alternative methodology based on evolutionary synthesis to enable uh, metabolite discovery in mushroom-forming fungi. So this is my group, and I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention today and open it up to questions.
preserve that cluster would take more energy or, you know, rather than just conserving one single gene alone. So it would be noticed that once a cluster has formed, that that cluster seed continues to just become preserved. Or do you notice that as the cluster gets formed, and at some point, that some, some desiccation happens? This is just a general question I'm asking, but this is how do you know exactly the that, that's a very important question. Uh, the gene clusters are not well preserved. Uh, when you think of vertical evolution, the inheritance from parent to offspring, the uh, gene clusters rapidly rearrange and are rapidly lost in a given lineage. The only time or the main times that we actually see them conserved is when they are horizontally transferred. So it's, it's almost as if they have no fitness uh, being passed from parent to offspring, but they need that strong selective pressure that's the selective pressure for surviving a horizontal gene transfer event. So a lot of the pathways that we're looking at today, the aflatoxin clusters, they rapidly rearrange and form new compounds. And um, I mean, you can imagine an individual fungus in its ecology is in an arms race with the plant that it's infecting. So the plant evolves a detoxification mechanism, well, that particular molecule is no longer important anymore. But if it acquires a new gene or it loses a gene and starts to make a new metabolite, now the arms race is back on. It can infect the host again. So in a vertical evolution scenario, evolution is rapid, but they're preserved by horizontal transfer. But even that does so I think that we have a little bit of bias when we see this entire genus of mushrooms makes it but that's it's actually not all that long in evolutionary history we think that all the organisms, all the time that psilocybin distribution represents is about 25 million years. Not a long time in, in biochemical evolution. So we've actually, in the psilocybin clusters, we, we see a lot of diversity. There's, some of them have a few extra genes. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of clusters have been lost, particularly in the lineage of Gymnopolis. So they're under the, they seem to be under that same, that same trend of genome evolution. I noticed there was a question on Marie that said that have you looked at the gene clusters as a means of identifying species that are actually linked to us to the Is that your way of identifying species in our first few years? Uh, we've never had the opportunity to do that. There are so many species of fungi uh, and most of them do not make psilocybin. So the chances that we would be surprised by finding, you know, some unknown fungus that we didn't already know made psilocybin is pretty slim. So no, we haven't identified magic mushrooms that way. More often what we see is we find an unexpected fungus like the cicada pathogen, the sospora, which seems to drive cicadas crazy. And they mate hyperactively and, and have very bizarre behavior. And we had no idea that they made psilocybin. And when we look in the genomes, they don't have the same genes. So we have no idea how they're making psilocybin. It's convergently uh, arrived at. So psilocybin presence is only the Usually. Wait, which slide? Uh, Here. I'll repeat the question. So the uh, it, it's strange that this pyloderma crocium here, which is a mycorrhizal fungus related to 
this fibula rhizoctonia species here, has just one of the uh, psilocybin genes here. It has the methyl transferase. Very bizarre. Uh, we think that it's because all three of these species are closely related. The ancestor probably had all of the genes uh, in a saprotrophic niche, uh, like these fungi have, or a path plant pathogen, plant saprotrophic niche. But the mycorrhizal fungi here, like Pyloderma, they tend to actually lose a ton of their metabolic genes and a lot of secondary metabolism genes. So they probably lost all the other genes and maintained just one of them for some other reason. That's the only example that we know of. There are, I should caveat that with uh, members of these gene families are more widespread, but they're very divergent. So the ones that I'm showing here are the ones that we feel are true orthologs based on the, the genetic distance between them. Great. So, yeah, I'll, I'll paraphrase the question that uh, the question was uh, how, in what ways might the closely related fungi, one produces psilocybin, one does not, what ways could that have come to be? Could it be due to silenced clusters that could be epigenetically modified to produce the compound and, or, or other, other differences? And what we've seen is there's a couple of ways that closely related fungi produce or don't. The ones that don't either never had the cluster or they lost most of the genes entirely from, from the gene cluster. We have one example in Gymnopolis where four of the five genes were deleted. And uh, in all the other lineages, the most closely related fungi seem to have never had the cluster. It, uh, it originated in one common ancestor and stayed. Uh, well, if you wanted to do some genetic engineering, gene clusters are actually quite promising for engineering entire pathways because you know most or all of the genes that are involved. And there are people that are considering or working on slicing out the entire gene cluster and putting it in fungi that you know, are much more easy to work with, like yeasts and, and that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. 
but I wonder how common it was. Uh, so the amount of horizontal, that's a great question. And, and people have been interested in horizontal transfer between plants and fungi because of their long-term relationships. And it's actually very rare. There's only a couple of genes that have been identified to have been transferred between fungi and plants. And they, I, I believe they're almost all involved in carbohydrate metabolism. Um, and how common in general is horizontal transfer amongst these, uh, amongst the fungi? In my opinion, because I think in these hundreds of millions of years time scale, when I'm looking at thousands of genomes across the entire tree, I say it's very common, but somebody else who's looking at an individual fungus might say it's not because it's not gonna happen this century in any one lineage. It may happen once every 5,000 years. In fact, we don't really know what the rate of actual transfer is. All we know is the percentage of genes in any particular genome that probably was recently horizontally transferred. Uh, maybe eventually we'll be able to uh, arrive at a particular rate. But I think you know, it's more common in fungi than in plants, and it's more common in bacteria than it is in fungi. In bacteria, it happens every day. In fungi, maybe every 100 years. I don't know. It's an open question. Okay, so the reason why I asked was um, we've been working with the plants for quite a long time. And I guess you have a product for it. That's, that's what we do. And uh, several years ago, we decided to look at some natural products uh, from endotypic fungi, which then we label this host plant. And we used a pretty cool technique. Actually, it's about 10 strains of fungi. But just surprisingly, uh, well, I would say sheer luck because we did the fermentation with the 10 fungi. And as far as I remember, it was just one uh, simple basic medium. And uh, we were able to identify two terpenes, acidic terpenes, which formed by the host plant uh, were actually by one of the fungi, and it produces both of them. Uh, these don't have the same common skeleton. They, they, they don't seem to be common, uh, but they are structurally, structurally they're, they're not really closely related. Uh, both of them, though, have insecticidal activity. And of course, I understood why the plant might produce it. I wasn't quite sure why the fungi. This is an amazing field of study. I'm glad you brought it up. The question is about how uh, a plant and its endophytic fungi, which are living inside it, may be making the exact same compound. Uh, the an initial thought that most people have is that the plant delivered the genes to the fungus by horizontal gene transfer, or vice versa. Uh, the cases that I know of, uh, that has not been shown. Uh, uh, taxol, uh, paclitaxol, that is um, a polyketide, I believe, that is made by a number of endophytic fungi and a number of plants, and they seem to use totally different genes to do it, totally unrelated genes to do it. Uh, I believe that uh, quinine is also made by a fungus called diaportha, which is endophytic to cinchona, uh, and there's no sign that they're they have overlapping genes, although I don't think we have a good genome for cinchona yet. So I think that my personal hypothesis on this is that they are organisms that converge upon the same molecule separately. And when fungi are producing a molecule, they simultaneously acquire the detoxification for that equipment for that molecule. So they may have you know, an, a drug exporter that's specific to paclitax, paclitaxel. And so that enables them to colonize a plant more easily that uses that as its primary defense against fungi. So that's my evolutionary hypothesis about it. Other people have also proposed that. Um, but other than that, I have no idea. It's just a very interesting phenomenon. We have two questions online. Uh, or do you sort of repeat the question? 
So all the uh, what there are young classes, so the presence of clusters like the synthesizing clusters affect the behavior of insects, including feeding, and may form the basis of their evolution, and may form the basis of their evolutionary conservation. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. The presence of clusters like the synthesizing clusters affect the behavior of insects, including feeding. And they form the basis of the uh, We think, rephrasing the question, yes, the, uh, we don't have evidence for it, but we do think that the psilocybin cluster is affecting the feeding of insects on the, on the fungus. And we think that they do so because it interacts with the 5-HT2 receptors, which in a lot of mycophagous insects is distributed throughout the esophageal ganglia uh, and can, in some circumstances, it's been shown to slow the feeding rate of Drosophila, other chemicals, not psilocybin in particular, but other chemicals slow the feeding rate of, uh, of insects by binding to those same receptors. So we think that that's probably the selective advantage for retaining psilocybin in mushrooms. But it's yet to be tested. It's a great question. The second question is Could we use CRISPR to insert psilocybin in a fish cluster and is there another type of pathogen that does not produce psilocybin? Uh, could you use CRISPR to insert psilocybin into another type of mushroom that does not produce it? Why not? Uh, it, some clusters are nice and compact, so they might be easier to transfer than others, build the construct to do a CRISPR insertion. I think that's a perfectly feasible. Uh, there have been examples of entire clusters being transferred between uh, different species, and they work out of the box. So that's the interesting, another interesting thing about gene clusters that I didn't mention. They tend to be very plug and play. They tend to be very modular. They encode a lot of their own necessary functions within the gene clusters, so they work where you put them. So I think so. So I'm not sure if I got the question. Is it uh, has there been horizontal transfer between mushrooms and insects? Uh, I am aware of, but not at this moment familiar with, an example of very small amounts of DNA being transferred between fungi and insects. But I can't recall off the top of my head. I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much.